Good evening, good evening, good evening, First Baptist Clinton family. I don't know about you, but you already know what time it is. I am excited because it is what? It's Wednesday night. And Wednesday night is our time for Bible study. It's our time to hop into the word of God. It is the word of God that we have hidden in our hearts. Why? So that we might not sin against him. I don't know about you, but uh, there's a whole lot of sinning happening in the land. And if I can help it, I don't want to sin intentionally against the God of our salvation. Uh, as you can tell, tonight is not live, uh, but that does not mean that the word is not going to be rich. And so if you will go ahead and take a moment, I need you to do two, maybe three things for me. I need you to go ahead and first comment. Let me know that you are watching. I can see your comments. And I want to encourage you to comment throughout the evening as you watch this uh, so that we can have dialogue in the comment sections. Talk to one another. Challenge each other. Let's grow in the word of God. Let's grow in the faith together. The second thing is I want you to like. I want you to like this. I want you to like it. I want you to like it. Come on, heck, I want you to love it. Do something, all right, like it or love it. And then lastly, I need you to hit that share button. There's somebody they're going through, they need a word from the Lord. There's somebody they uh, just are, are, are hungry for the word of God and they're looking for trustworthy voices. If you trust my voice, if you believe that I have something worth saying and something worth sharing, won't you hit that share button? I would love to be able to share the word of God with somebody tonight. Didn't God meet us in a beautiful way on this past Sunday? We were talking about uh, Isaac digging the wells and he was digging the well of Essex. He dig the well of contention. And then after everybody wanted his well, he went a little bit further. And he dug a well and named it Rehoboth, meaning God has created room. I'm excited because somebody is already at a testimony. Somebody is walking into a testimony called Rehoboth. God is making room for some things in your life. And for that, I celebrate you and I give God the glory. We collectively as a community give God the glory and give God the praise for the great things that he's doing in your life. Well, I think it's time to go ahead and hop into the study, to hop into the word of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come online to study the word of the, of the, the word of God. I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Somebody said, don't that mean the church? No, 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 no. The gates is his presence. I will enter into his gates to his presence with thanksgiving. And I will enter his courts with praise. I will be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Yes, Lord. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Here, here here's my favorite one. Oh, magnify. I feel something already tonight. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together for the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in it and they are safe. I'm just glad to be alive. Anybody else glad to be alive? Anybody glad that God decided to keep you? Anybody glad that God sustains you? He touches your body. He gives you a reasonable portion of health, life, and strength. Come on, take a moment, and let's make this Bible study conducive for a mighty move of God. Come on, take a moment, and just begin to lift up 
up the name of Jesus. Take a moment and open up your mouth and tell him thank you. Come on, take a moment and tell him how much you love him. Take a moment and just give him glory. Give him praise. Pour out of your spirit to him. Now, come on, do it now. Come on, pour out of your spirit to him now. If you know he's good, if you know he's been better than good to you, if you know he's been better than kind to you, give him praise, give him glory, and give him honor. Shall we approach the throne of grace together? Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, before we ask you for anything, we, we've taken this moment and we continue to take this moment to praise you for everything. I heard somebody say, Lord, if I had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to give you praise. It wouldn't be enough to give you glory. God, we just thank you for what you are doing in our midst. We thank you for what you are doing even in this relationship. God, we just ask now, Lord, that you would just have your own way. We feel your presence now. God, let the words that are spoken out of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. Bring the revealer. God, we thank you that this teaching is going to Touch and penetrate the hearts of those that love you. God, may a sinner come across this. May someone who doesn't know you come across it. Because we're all sinners. Lord, forgive me. But, but, but may someone who doesn't know you come across it. And may they ask, what must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, tonight, as we look at our Bible study, tonight, as we uh, go through, uh, we are going to go to the New Testament book of Luke. Let me pull it up here. We're going to go to the New Testament book of Luke, Luke chapter 17. And um, Luke chapter 17 ought to be very familiar to us. Uh, it, it, it ought to be very familiar to us, the part that we will focus on today. I'm going to walk us up to the place in which we're going to uh, put in our work. Is that all right? I'm going to walk us up to the place uh, in which we're going to let down our anchor. Uh, Luke chapter 17, uh, we will find that Jesus is speaking with his disciples. And as he's speaking with his disciples, uh, he is doing what he will to be able <clears throat> to prove a point. Uh, I, I really need my water. I got a little water here. Y'all give me a second. Y'all see that beautiful H-U? Hi. It's almost homecoming. Come on. Support Black College. Okay. And so he is, um, he, he is talking with his disciples. Uh, and with Jesus talking to his disciples, much of what he would do when speaking to his disciples would be to speak in parables because Jesus was speaking on things that were outside of the scope of his disciples at times. Uh, Jesus was speaking from an eternal place. He was speaking of things prophetically, things that were to come. And so in order to make sure that those that followed him would be able to really understand his message and his method, he began to say what he needed to say, but to break it down in the language that they could understand called parables. Won't somebody take a moment and write that in parables, parables, parables. Oh, okay. It, it, it won't let me do it, but you, you all do it, okay? So he's speaking with them in parables. And as uh, before, as we were looking in Luke chapter 16, just the chapter before, he was speaking on the parable of the dishonest manager. Uh, and, and with that, uh, he was speaking to them about how charges were being brought to him and that there was squandering on the property. Uh, after that, in Luke chapter 16, verse 19, he was speaking of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. 
the rich man was often called dives, D-I-V-E-S, right? Uh, dives and purple, very expensive clothes mm -hmm. with loyalty. And Lazarus' character was showing in these scriptures. Well, after that, it leads us to chapter 17, where there is a peril here that is causing temptation. And so let's go in to Luke chapter 17, if we will. See, Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you, <clears throat> excuse me, than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and say, I repent, you must forgive. Okay, let, let's take a moment. Let, let's, let's really dive into this thing. Uh, Jesus is talking about stumbling. Jesus is talking about sinning. I, I, I like the way in which Jesus frames this by saying stumbling. What, what does it mean to stumble? Well, if you've ever, if you're like me, <laughs> sometimes you, you might be a little clumsy. Uh, you, you ever been walking and you tripped on your own two feet? <laughs> or maybe have you ever been walking outside and you end up stumbling a little bit, you end up tripping and you were like, Lord, it's like the sidewalk was just raised on me, right? Stumbling is not prayerfully, it's not something that you're doing often, right? Stumbling is something uh, that happens at a time when the conditions are right and we just can't help ourselves. And the reality is, is that a lot of the sin that we say is stumbling really isn't stumbling, it's intentional. When I'm walking outside and the sidewalk raises up on me, I'm not intentionally tripping over the sidewalk. If I'm walking and something is going on and I kind of trip over my own foot or something is happening, right, where, where, where the ground is one type of texture and your shoe is another type of texture and it makes you to stumble, I'm not doing that intentionally. Stumbling is something, it just happens because the condition was right. And here Jesus is saying that if you get into a place of where you are stumbling with sin, you're stumbling with, and, and sin is anything that doesn't bring glory to God, right? Sin is anything that go against the commandments of God. If you are stumbling with sin, it's better for you to have a millstone by your neck and thrown into the sea for, versus for you to cause someone else to stumble. Right. Because what, what ends up happening is that uh, if, if we're not careful, our convictions will begin to die down. Help me, Holy Ghost. And when our convictions begin to die down, if we can cause our own selves to stumble, then eventually that same influence or that lack of self-control, that lack of discipline that we have on our own lives will begin to spread to someone else's. Come on, let's be real. Let's be honest. Have you ever been in a situation where you know you're good, where you know that uh, you, you can do whatever you need to do on your own, but you got around that certain person and that certain person causes you to do certain things? Mm -hmm. That certain person uh, uh, causes you or... Or, or helps you feel comfortable doing something that you said that you wouldn't, right? That, that is what uh, is being talked about here in the scriptures. The reality is, is that we have to be careful 
about the way in which we approach our relationship with God. We have to be careful about the things in which we do. You know, sin is really like the analogy of the frog in hot water. Somebody said, how do you cook a frog? Some of y'all laughing right now because you already know. You, you, don't, you don't cook a frog by having the, by having the, uh, the, the water boiling and all this, right, and throwing it in. Because what's going to happen? The moment the frog feels the hotness of the water, the frog will begin to jump out of the pot. But the way that you cook a frog is that you put a frog in water at room temperature. Then what happens is that the frog being, I believe the correct word is amphibious. Let, let me make sure that, that I'm saying that right. No, no, no. Well, a frog is amphibious, but um, but okay, I, I, I'll, I'll think of the word and I'll comment it. But, but a frog is able to adapt to its environment, right? Right. So, so when the frog is able to adapt to its environment, when you put the frog in the water, you let it sit, and it's just gonna sit there. It's gonna be chilling. It's gonna make bubbles. It's gonna do all that. It's gonna say, man. You know, th this environment is, is different, but it's not too bad. It doesn't feel too bad. And then slowly you begin to turn up the heat. Ah. And so as you turn up the heat, you don't turn it up and turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. You turn up the heat, then you let it stop for a moment. And then the frog says, you know what? The, the, the temperature is, is changing, but I'm able to adapt to the temperature. You turn it up some more, let it sit. Turn it up some more, let it sit. At a certain point, the water will get to a certain temperature where it's cooking. Ah, the, the water will get to a certain temperature where it is starting to affect the skin, where it is starting to affect the insides. And then after a while, the fit, the, the, um, the, the, the frog will be being cooked and don't even realize it. After a while, by the time when it says, wait a minute, something's not right. I've got to get out of it. It's so cooked. It's so already baked that they can't move like they might would. Right. And, and, and that is what happens to us. Some of us, we have allowed ourselves to be like the frog in boiling it. Well, in cooking waters, we, we have, we, we used to be to a point where we say, no, 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 I, I don't go here because going here will cause the BC me to come out. Come on. The before Christ me. I, I, I don't, I don't hang out with these types of people because, because no, 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 that that's not something that I want to be able to prepare perpetuate. I don't, I don't do these certain things because I don't have enough self-control and I know me enough to know that if I do this, that it's going to probably end up leading here. Come, come on somebody. Come. Am, am I talking to anybody here? And so, and so we have to uh, be careful because many of us are being cooked and we don't even know it. Help me, Holy Ghost. Many of us are being cooked and we don't even know it. Our standards are being lowered and we don't even realize it. Our standards are being lowered and it's all in the name of good fun. It's all in the name of we're being taking, we're taking ourselves too serious. It's all in the name of we've got to keep up with the culture. I wish I had some help in here. I wish I had somebody that would talk to me in here. And God is saying to us today that he does not want us to stumble. But even more important, he doesn't want you to call somebody else to stumble. Because imagine your testimony as a Christian is that you played a part in breaking up the purity of somebody else's walk with God. Woo! Imagine your testimony as a Christian is that you played a part in bringing down godly standards all because of your lackadaisical conviction. And so God 
is saying, verse 3, be on your guard. In other words, watch out for the enemy. Can I help somebody? Watch out for your flesh. Watch out for yourself. Be on your guard. And if the same person sins, or rather, if, if, if another disciple sins, you've got to rebuke them. You know, sometimes we, we have taken, especially in our churches, rebuke. We, we have taken rebuke and made it something that is really not, right? We, we've taken rebuke as embarrassment versus taking rebuke as the, as the, um, as the correction that it's supposed to be. We've taken rebuke as, oh, you went and you had a child outside of where lie. Go stand in front of the church and repent. No, 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 no. What, where is the rebuke for when folk can't talk to one another? Where is the rebuke for when people can't get on one accord? Where is the rebuke? Yeah, 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 y'all don't want me to go here. Yeah, y'all, y'all don't want me to go. Where is the rebuke for when somebody offends someone else? Are y'all with me? Where's the rebuke for where you're for when your godly for when your character doesn't match up to what we say and preach and teach? Rebuking is good for us. Because rebuking is a form of accountability. Rebuking says that you know better. Rebuking says you can do better. Are y'all with me here tonight? That's what rebuking is. And then the Bible says, if the same person sins against you seven times, turns back to you seven times, and say, I repent, you must forgive. God is saying, I don't care how you feel. Somebody asks for forgiveness, you give it to them. I don't care how many times somebody does wrong against you. If they ask for forgiveness, you give it to them. Many of us, many of us are just like the, the disciples. Look at verse five. They said, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> Lord, I hear you, but I need you to increase my faith. Lord, I, I, I'm processing, I'm, I'm getting what you're saying, but I need you to increase my faith. Why? Because I can't do this. I'm getting excited here. I'm about to just flipping everything over. Why? Because I can't do this on my own. Lord, I, I mean, I, I know you the Lord, you, you you the God, you you all this, you all that, but I can't do that because I still got a nook if you buck in my spirit. Come on, come on. Lord, I can't do that because if I'm honest, I can hold a grudge and it don't even matter. Lord, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, I'm just not built like that. But God is saying to us tonight that we have to learn how to forgive, right? We have to learn how to forgive because here's the reality. Forgiveness really ain't about the other person. I wish I had a church in here. Forgiveness really ain't about what they did to you. Forgiveness is about you. Forgiveness is about your peace. Are y'all with me tonight? Forgiveness is about your strength. Forgiveness is, is about what God would desire to do in you. Are you with me? Forgiveness is really so that you don't have high blood pressure, right? Forgiveness helps you to be able to move forward even when others can't. Because here's the reality. Many of us are walking around upset with people who aren't even paying us any mind. Many of us are walking around upset with people because we say that person owes me an apology. Can, 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 I, can I be honest with us tonight? It's Bible study. It's our conversation. Come on in here. 
Nobody really owes you anything. <laughs> Come on. I, I, I said nobody really owes you anything. Right? Right? Not even God. God gives us new mercies. Morning by morning, it's new mercies we see. God gives us grace and mercy, right? But, but nobody owes us anything. I, I, I know that's hard. I, I, I know some of us uh, might, might feel otherwise, but I, I'm going to be honest. If, if anything, we owe things to ourselves. Yeah, we, we owe it to ourselves to be better versions of ourselves. We owe it to ourselves to be better than who we were yesterday. Are y'all with me here? We owe it to ourselves to, to, to elevate ourselves to where God would have us to be. Not to compete on social media. Not to keep up with the Joneses. Not to keep track with who did this and who did that against you. We owe it to ourselves to forgive. All right. Uh, verse six, we're still in Luke 17. We're, we're, we're walking to where we're going. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Isn't it amazing that another time where we see that same line from Jesus, he said that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain to move. Okay. Now mountains are huge. Mountains are, 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 are vast. They are planted. But he's saying here that you can say to a tree that is planted to be uprooted and planted not where not by a sea, but in the sea. Now, now you 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 can't move too fast past that, right? I, I, I can see the whole idea of a mountain, right? I, I can see the whole idea of shape shifting of land through faith. But what what but what the scripture is saying that I can take a tree and plant the tree in the sea. I could plant the tree in water, have his roots to take form in water. It, yeah, I, 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 I don't think y'all get it. We can go down to the deepest of the deepest of the depths of the sea that we don't even know where creatures live and it will obey us. In other words, this scripture is saying that you can do the most impossible thing with faith. Where is your faith? Can we do a temperature check? How much faith do you have in God really? How much faith, I'm asking again, do you have in God really? Do you really believe that God is able? Do you really believe that God can open blinded eyes? Do you really believe that God can close some doors that can work in your favor? Do you really believe that God can heal bodies? Do you really believe, my God, today that he can pay off that debt, that he can pay off that bill, that he can cause a confusion in the computer system and make your student loan go from whatever it is to zero? I I need some folk. I'm just wondering, do you really have faith in God? Do you really believe that he can do the impossible? So many times we put God to the metric of our human ability. We put God to the metric of our human systems, not realizing that it was God that enabled the system. But he's not only a God of the system, but he's a God that works outside of the system. And so he will make sure that you have whatever you need. Come on. I need you to declare that, that God is going to make sure that I have have whatever I need. How do I know that God is going to give me whatever I need? Because his name is I am that 
I am. So whatever he is able to do, that is who he is. Ah, somebody catch that. Whatever he's able to do, that is who he is. If you need some peace, he is peace. If you need love, he is love. If you need joy, he is joy. I am that I am. Love that I am. Forgiveness that I am. I don't know what you need God to do. Y'all forgive me because I hear something trying to creep up in my voice. I don't know what you need God to do, or rather, I don't know what you need God to show up as, but I'm telling you that whatever you need him to do, whatever you need him to be, that he will be. Okay, let me calm down. Y'all know I get excited over the word of God. Ah, whew. Hey, hey, hallelujah. Come on, somebody give God praise right there because he's going to be that what you need him to be. All right, verse seven. All right, come on, let's go. We're still in Luke chapter 17. Is this blessing anybody? We're a little bit over halfway there. Come on, is this blessing anybody? Look at verse seven. Who among you would say to your slave who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once? And take your place at the table. Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later, you may eat and drink. Do you think the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, <clears throat> where you have done all that you ought to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. Okay, th this is powerful imagery here, right? Th this is powerful imagery here because Jesus is talking about having slaves or if we want to mm, take it down a notch, right? Jesus is talking about having servants, right? Now, if we're reading through a African-American lens, which I think all of us or majority of us who are watching are, Right. That that term slave can uh, kind of mess us up here. Right. But again, he's speaking through the lens in which they will understand. This is the parable here. In other words, he is telling them that there is an obligation to be obedient. Mm, somebody catch this in the Holy Ghost. He said there is an obligation to be obedient. It's amazing that in our church culture, I'm not just talking about one church, I'm talking about the culture of the big C church, we place sacrifice over obedience. Come on, think about that. We place sacrifice over obedience. We talk about, I did this and I do that and I did this and I do that sacrifice. I, I gave up time here. Sacrifice. I, I, I went the extra mile and did that. That's sacrifice. But the question for us to think about tonight is I thank God for your sacrifice. But the question is, where was your obedience? Now, sometimes Obedience is in the sacrifice. Are y'all with me here? But then there are other times when the thing that we sacrifice to do is not the thing that we should have done out of obedience. Come on here tonight. Come, come on here tonight. Y'all remember the scripture where it says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Imagine some of us are going to get to the pearly gates and God is going to say, I thank you for doing that. But what was required was this. If we could take a moment and think in our lives, could some of the busyness of our lives be sacrifice? Why some of the places of apprehension, of greatest apprehension is actually obedience? 
Lord, help us to not just be those who are great at sacrifice, but terrible at obedience. Because the breakthrough is in the obedience. Yeah, 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 yeah. The breakthrough is in the obedience. The results that we're looking for is in the obedience. Are y'all with me here? The great things that God has designed and stored up for us is in the obedience. Help us, God, to not just sacrifice, but to be obedient. All right, let's go. Verse 11. This is where I wanted us to get to. Verse 11 uh, through 19. You know, one of the things I love, I love about the word of God is parables. I love the parables in the scripture because these are the moments in which we are able to really zoom in and to look at Jesus's words. Are y'all with me here? These are the moments that we are able to, to really zoom in and to consider that which Christ would say to us. Because many of the words and the things that we lived in the um and the legalistic rules that we go by are actually not the words of Jesus. Hmm. They're actually the words of Paul, right? And so help us to be, uh, the, the, these studies will help us to be more closer followers of the, um, of the, uh, I don't want to say demand or the command, it will help us to be more closer followers to the ideals that Jesus would have us to have uh, than anything else. All right. Luke chapter 17, verse 11. This ought to be real familiar to us. Let's see uh, what God is going to speak to us from here. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. Now, when Jesus is walking through Samaria and Galilee, now you know that this is home, right? Jesus is a hometown boy. He, he, he's feeling good. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, that's the school I went to. Oh, that's that temple I went to with those men. Oh, is that the manger? That's the manger? Come on here, somebody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. He's walking. Through the region, and as he entered a village, ten lepers approached him, keeping their distance. Somebody might be wondering, why is it, how is it that they could approach him but keep their distance? Well, think about it. We we went through a whole pandemic, you know, six feet, please. Right, <laughs> right. So, so, so here it is. Here it is. They, they, they're coming up to Jesus. Right. Did they want to be able to get close enough to get his attention, but stay far away enough to have the respect factor? Because the reality is that leopards during that time, not leopards like like the animals, but leper. Right. Lepers during that time, um, um, they were they were unclean, considered unclean. Their skin is shriveled up and. Body parts are decaying, and sometimes it can be deformed. And I was gonna show a picture, but I, I, I'm not gonna do y'all like that. If you want to look it up, look up a leper, right, or leprosy, and then hit images on Google so you can see it for yourself, right? You, they, they can look really, really bad. But here's the other thing: they can also be very, very contagious. Okay, stick with that. They can look bad but then they can also be contagious. They were outcast socially. So when they would move into places where people were, they had to announce, hey, I've got leprosy. Hey, y'all might want to move out my way. Hey, I'm coming through. I'm unclean. Imagine the embarrassment that this would bring upon people with this disease. A disease that they got from more than likely being in contact with somebody else that had it. Could it be, thinking back to a point that Jesus made about being a stumbling block, that some of us have leprosy and we don't even know it. 
We have a leprosy that not affects our skin, but we have a leprosy that affects our spirit. We have a leprosy that makes us talk about folk instead of pray for them. My God. We have a leprosy that makes us judge people instead of understanding them. We have a leprosy that makes us to think ungodly things or to think the worst of people instead of letting us see the best in them. We have infected people who are around us. And so now we have a contagious Christianity that doesn't point people to the Savior, but actually points people to ourselves. We have a, a Christianity that makes people not want to go to church to the point that they say, and that is why I don't go to church. Leprosy is contagious. Look at verse 13. They called out saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priests. Okay. It's a lot that's happening right here. It's a lot that's happening right here. When they're saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. This is a loaded statement of really they're saying, God, touch us. God, help us. This statement of have mercy on us is a posturing of the heart. Mm -hmm. It is a posturing of the heart to say, we've tried so many things, but we heard you was in town and we're so glad that we seen you and sent you. We didn't seen you. Can you see about me? Since we've seen you, is there anything that you can do to help? And all Jesus says is go and show yourself to the priests. Okay. All right. Go show yourself to the priests. If I was in this condition and I'm asking for mercy, I think a question that would come to mind is, why am I going to go show myself to the priest? What is going to show myself to the priest going to do for me? Can, can anybody understand this? Can anybody get this? Does anybody think, without having knowledge of the text, putting that to the side, Think about it critically. Why am I going to show myself to the priest? Why am I going to be unclean in front of the priest? Isn't it amazing that anytime Jesus is about to do something, he does things that make no sense. Seemingly. <laughs> anytime Jesus has something in mind, he will do the very opposite of that which you expect in order that he might move on your behalf. Look at what it says. As he says, go show yourself to the priest. The Bible says, Woof. and as they went, they were made clean. Remember, I talked about the frog. The frog that doesn't realize he's cooked until he gets in the water. Until the water begins to change. I wonder at what leg of the journey it was when they began to walk that they started to notice that they were being cleansed. Ah. Uh. I need somebody to get this. I, I wonder that as they were going to the priest, as they were following what Jesus said, I wonder, I wonder, when is it that they said, wait a minute, my skin is clearing up. Well, well, wait a minute. 
not feeling a whole lot better. Wait, wait a minute. I don't stink. I don't smell like I once did. My God, today. But then the Bible says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. All right. We've got to figure this out. We got to figure this out. In this line of verse 14, it says, and as they went, they were made clean. Okay. But verse 15 says, for one of them, when he saw that he was healed. Okay. Verse 14 puts me in the mind of a progressive cleansing or progressive healing. But verse 15 seems to be an immediate healing. Hmm. This raises tension in the text. Were some of them being made clean as they went, but that one was the one that was healed? Were they all healed, but the journey required or the journey made cleansing possible? What, what, what do y'all think on there? What do y'all think on there? I wonder how far did he have to go? Was it in the matter of a step or two? How did he see he was healed? Did he look in a puddle and see himself? Was there a mirror nearby and he saw himself? How did he know he was healed? But however, but we would have to infer that he couldn't have gotten but so far away from Jesus. Watch this. When he saw it, he turned back. He praised God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Whew, boy, this is so good. This is so rich. My question is, okay, I, I know we hear this. I know we hear this, but I've got to ask it for the sake of asking it. Was he wrong to turn back? Was he wrong to go to Jesus. If he really. So okay. Wait a minute. Was the cleansing. Was the healing. Based on going to the priest. Or was it based on their obedience. Okay. Was, the, was it that the priest. Would heal them. Clearly it couldn't have been. But it was the obedience that they said, I'm going to go to the priest. Look at verse 19. He said to him, no, no, no. Verse 17. Then Jesus asked, were not 10 made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? I like how the scripture is using this idea of clean and healed. That healing ought to bring about cleansing. And he said to him, get up, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. There's a lot going on. There's this dichotomy of cleansing, healing, and being made well. Okay. Wow. Okay. This, this is a lot to unpack. There's a, the kind of, is there a difference between cleansing, healing, and being made well? Okay. Okay. I think, I think this, right? Here's what I think. I would love to know what you think. I think the obedience of going to the priest that they were told to go to brought them 
the cleansing. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Why do I think that? Because as and as they went, they were made clean. Okay. But then verse 15 says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God. Okay. All right. So I think their obedience cleansed them. I think, I think, watch this. All right. Ready for this? I think a self acknowledgement brought the healing, right? Revelation brought the healing, but it's faith that makes you well. Let me say it again clean. Obedience brings cleansing. Revelation brings healing. But acknowledgement to God makes through faith makes you well. Ah, oh, we could argue this back and forth. But that's what I'm going to go with tonight. What if some of us we're only experiencing one third of that which God really wants to give us. What if God actually wants to cleanse us, heal us, and make us well? But we're satisfied with cleansing alone. Are y'all with me? Right? All right. Well, listen, I, I got to stop there. My time is gone. My time is far spent. Oh, Luke 17 is rich. It's rich. It's rich. I pray that this Bible study has been a mighty, mighty blessing to you. Clinton, I love y'all. I love y'all. I love y'all. I love teaching Bible study. I love the way in which we um, have built this connection. I look forward to going back and looking at your comments and thinking about different things and challenging each other in the word of God. In the word of God, I've got a hiding place. <laughs> well, that's it for now. I will see you next week. Or, well, actually not next week. Uh, when am I back? Help me, Holy Ghost. I, I'll, I'll see y'all on the 9th of November. All right. I'll see you on the 9th of November unless somebody calls me and asks me to come. All right. I love you guys. And there's nothing in the world you can do about it.